Hello and welcome to Enlightened Empaths, your community for the spiritually awakened, where we discuss, explore, and connect with fellow empaths, healers, intuitives, and seekers. Hello, empaths. Thank you for joining us this week. We're going to be discussing our Community Connection Show, which is where we get to share stories and questions that you guys have taken time out of your day to send to us, which we always appreciate. Before we do that, Janice, how are you doing this week? I'm doing really well. How about yourself? Yeah, I'm excited. Summer's pretty much here, and I think it's just going to be a much, much better summer than than any of us are expecting. Don't you think we're going to have this this happy, positive shift, and everything's going to kind of relax and calm down a bit? I hope so. I think it's well deserved for all of us to just have some ease and some grace and some time to recharge our batteries a little bit. Yes, that's what I wish for all of us. Okay, I'm going to dive into our first question if you're ready. I'm ready. All right. This one says, three years ago, none of this was on my radar. Spirituality, loved ones and spirit, guides, none of it. But my awakening came when my dearest friend Eric passed in 2021. I lost him in his physical body, but he opened me to this whole beautiful world that was always here, but I never tuned into it. The bond he and I shared in the physical world was so special And that bond remains and has grown and deepened after his passing. I talk to my friend each and every day. In some ways, I feel closer to him now than I did while he was walking this earth. Eric is amazing at sending me signs. He was brilliant in life and continues to show his brilliance in spirit. Eric was always health conscious, ate healthy exercise, took care of his body. So it's no surprise he's often with me as I go about my daily routine of exercising in my basement where I have a gym. As a key side note, decades ago, my cousin asked if she could store her collection of books at my house. I have built-in bookcases in my basement and they were empty, so of course I said yes. Decades later, those books remain in the bookcases. I've never read any of the books. I might move them occasionally. I'm embarrassed to say this is maybe every few years to tidy up, but right back in the bookcases they go. Basically, the books have been essentially untouched for decades. One morning while I'm working out, I sat on my weight bench while in between sets. All of a sudden, for some reason, I don't know why, I got up and walked over to the bookcase. And without thinking or looking, I grabbed one book off the shelf and flipped through the pages. Well, I stopped on one page because there was a slip of paper tucked in the book. On the paper was an illustration of a flower and the words, for a special friend. I knew in my heart that Eric somehow got my soul to walk over to the bookcase and remove that specific book out of hundreds of books and flip through it to let me know that he is with me. And I'm sure showing his approval that I'm keeping up my exercise routine. If this wasn't enough, here's the cap on the bottle that shows Eric's brilliance. He chose to send this sign through a book, which makes perfect sense because he was a very successful author. The title of the book, by the way, is The Ghost Who Fell in Love. I left the slip of paper in the book right where it was, but brought the book into my bedroom. One of these days, I'll read it. There's no question in my mind and heart that our loved ones find unique ways to show us they are still very, very present. Wow. I I love that story for so many reasons. One is the way our listener uses this phrase, I lost him in his physical body. Mm-hmm. I remember when my uh, former mother-in-law, Maggie, passed away and my Reiki teacher sent me a card and she said, I am so sorry for the physical loss of your mother-in-law. I, I don't know why, Denise, that, that sentence brought me so much comfort. And I've tried to use it myself whenever I have to send grief condolence cards out. Because it just I remember staring at that sentence and going, yeah, that's right. Like I, I won't be able to hug her again or, you know, hold her hand as she holds my kids' hands and we all cross the street to the park. But that's all I've lost is her physical presence. She's still going to be with us. So I love that our listener pointed that out. And I also love the way the whole thing is described about, you know, you're just sitting there every day. You go downstairs, you do your workout, you don't even look at the books for decades. And then one day you just are like, yeah. And and it was when she was in the zone. Do you ever notice that these, these spiritual, psychic, intuitive phenomenon tend to happen when we're in the zone, whether that's driving, showering, working out? 
or cleaning the house, doing something mundane and repetitive that we're used to. That's often what our monkey mind, our overthinking brain is calm enough for spirit to get through to us. But what a beautiful message. And now I have to check out that book, The Ghost Who Fell in Love. My, my, my. <laughs> and you, you, that's a really, really good point that you just brought up of so many of us will ask for a sign and then we'll, even if we're not consciously looking for it, we're kind of keeping a half an eye out for, oh, is that my sign? Is that my sign? But then when we forget about it is when it, it pops right up. It just shows up. And I think that that is a huge thing. But I love that the friend that Eric brought her down to the books and she found that because that's so specific to him, to him being an author, to the title of the book. It's just a beautiful, beautiful story. It really is. Thank you for taking time to send that in. So our next one is really quick and it says, I wanted to say a quick thank you for this week's episode about signs from spirit. I always find these so sh shows so comforting. I've asked my guides about an issue that's very important to me. I asked for a specific sign for yes and another for no, but I'm seeing them both. One day I see the sign for yes and get very excited. The next day I get the sign for no. What does this mean? I, I would say it's undecided <laughs> oh, because maybe spirit is trying to nudge you closer to uh, your own inner knowing about what this should be. So they're giving you the duality of Yes, this is one option and maybe exploring that a little bit further when you get the yes of what would be entailed with that decision if that's what really happens and the same with the no response. What do you think? Okay, well, this happens to me a lot and and here and it annoys me and it's why my spirit guides, maybe I need to fire them all and just have a new team. No, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. But what'll happen if I ask for a sign for something pretty ordinary and normal, right? Like should I do this this month or should I try that next month or whatever? I'll get I'll get my sign. But if I'm going through, you know, one of those crossroad moments in your life, you know, should I stay or should I go? Like one of those big before mm -hmm. and after moments. When I ask for a sign with those moments, my guides are like, girl, you are on your own. And so I will often see the yes and no signs. And the first couple of times that happened to me, well, really, to be honest, what I thought was, oh, this whole sign business is such BS. Like, we're just here on this little ball floating through space alone. Like, I, I just, I really started to doubt everything when I would get those mixed messages. But then everything for me anyway is hindsight. I never learn in the moment. I always learn when I'm reflecting back and looking back on those moments. I remember thinking, oh yeah, I was supposed to be alone. I can remember making a major, major life decision. I asked for a sign, you know, show me this for yes, that for no. I saw both. And then I was like, all right, that's not helping. So I called everyone in my family. I called my sisters. I called my friends. I called my mom. Nobody picked up. And let me tell you, my mom's always home, right? Always. Mm -hmm. And I just remember thinking, oh, this is one of those moments that I have to do all by myself. And I know the footprints prayer, like, you know, you're never really alone, blah, blah, blah. I get it. It's true. I believe it. But you feel alone in those moments, right? And you feel like, oh, I'm on my own and I'm not getting any signs or guidance. But I'll tell you what, in those moments when I've had to make those decisions all by myself, when I take the time to go within and really listen to what's best for me, and I make the best decision for me, it's so much better. It's such a better feeling and such a better result than if I had followed some signs from spirits or followed advice from friends and family. So even though this can be conflicting and confusing, trust, just trust that you've got this, that you and your wise, beautiful soul, that you know what to do. And that when you see those mixed messages, it's really your guide's way of saying you can do this all by yourself. You're ready. Picture yourself when you were four or five on a bike and, and you know, your, your caregiver pushed the back of your banana seat and you were like, oh, I'm pedaling by myself. Wasn't that the best feeling compared to your, your parents, like, you know, holding the handlebars as you, as you rush down the road? What they're doing is they're letting you know you can do this on your own. That's my take. That's really well said. And I don't know, I think for many of us, I, I know it's for me, is when I'm in that crossroads of trying to make a decision, I'll over 
become overly reliant on the divination technique. I might start throwing the cards. Oh, what does the pendulum say? Oh, is that a sign? Like trying to find confirmation or validation for one over the other. And for me personally, it it takes stepping away from all of it completely and doing something completely different. Maybe go for a walk or you know do something that's just boring and mundane thing that we all have to do in some of our everyday lives. And that sometimes hits the, the the breaker switch to get more clarity as well. Yeah, that's such a good point. I know when I reshuffle the tarot deck for a different answer, that's when I know, mm, Samantha. Mm-mm. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Our next one says, one thing that I have not stopped chewing on is your ethical stance on not reading others unless they have asked for it first. Yet, Samantha was nudged towards the intuitive arts and Reiki by just such a person. I think she said it was at a psychic fair she attended with her dad. How do you reconcile the two? Okay, so I'll give my take on this. And then, Denise, I want to hear yours because I know you, um, you've you got such great views on this. So I was at a crystal show with my father years ago when I first started getting into crystals. I think this was 2004. And I was just looking to buy crystals. I don't even know if there were traditional psychic readers at this crystal show, but there was a woman selling crystal jewelry and she walked up to my dad and she said, I have a message for you from your father. Is it okay if I share it? And I guess that is unsolicited, right? But she did ask permission. And Mm -hmm. my dad was always, you know, I, I think I've told listeners, my dad started taking me to psychic fairs when I was like 14. So he was always in and out of this world, super open to it. And then something bad would happen in his life and he'd be like, it's all nothing. So I had a very, very mixed upbringing in terms of being open to this stuff. So he was like, yeah, sure. So she took him aside and gave him his reading. And I kept like, I just kept walking further and further away because my dad was getting emotional and my dad's not a crier. And I was like, oh, I need to give him privacy. And she kept saying, wait, wait, I have a message for you too. And I get, yeah, now that I think about it, it was, she didn't ask me, she asked my dad, but she just said, I have a message for you. And when she was done with my dad, she said, you're a healer. Your guides want you to know you need to get Reiki. And I was like, Ray, what? I'd never heard of it. But yeah, Mm -hmm. that's true. Huh. Well, gosh, Denise, now I don't know. I had a whole different way I was going to go because she did ask for permission with my dad, but not not with me. I have done unsolicited readings on people the the first year or two that I was, you know, opening up and exploring my my abilities and what I could do. I was like a kid in a candy store, and I didn't understand the ethics of it, and I thought it was so amazing and great. And it wasn't until I, you know, freaked out a few people you know, who just weren't, who were just going about their day and just trying to work or, or grocery shop. And I'm like, Hey, your dad's here, (laughs) you know, and just freaked them out that I started to really think about the ethical consequences of that. Um, Remember like the AC guy who came to my house and he was like a born again Christian Mm -hmm. that really freaked him out. So it took me a while to understand the ethics of that. So um, yeah, in the beginning I did drive by readings and I guess, yeah, my, my gateway into all of this was a drive-by reading too. I I think that's pretty normal though. I really do because I wanted to share that and I thought it was really cool and it was very much about, oh, well, your your grandma's there and this and that. And then I realized people weren't as open to it, but I kind of think that's a rite of passage when you're first opening up is to want to share what you're getting because you're trying to be helpful or because you you're just so fascinated by it that you're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm sure they'd want this message or they'd want this insight. That being said, now I'm very, very cautious not to do that, even with people that are I feel close to and I can say, oh, I just got a, a nudge or a hit or whatever. Cause I think ha- having res- respecting people's privacy and their right to choose whether or not they want you in their auric field mucking around. Uh, But uh, my question was when you were with your dad, were you a kid when she just said you're a healer? No, no, gosh, no. I was married. Oh, okay. I had uh, two kids. Chloe wasn't here yet. So no. Thank you for making me that much younger though in 2004. (laughs) (laughs) 
I do have to share with listeners a quick funny story. So Denise is incredibly ethical with with her amazing abilities, but she sent me an email and she said, um, I keep getting this. She was a very positive little message for my youngest, Chloe. And she said, I don't want to peek into her psychic window. So that's all I'm going to say. And so I... I open up my phone and I read the email to Chloe and Chloe goes, peek, Denise, peek, peek <laughs> into my window. <laughs> so sometimes people do appreciate a drive-by reading. True. But if you're doing this work, just err on the side of caution and ask permission. And interestingly, if you go to any spiritualist church and they're bringing, even if you're sitting down to do a reading, they'll say, may I come to you? And they'll yes. always ask permission. So, and I catch myself sometimes in readings, if someone has come for more intuition stuff saying, are you comfortable with someone in spirit stepping forward? Because I think it's, for some people, that's not a comfortable thing. Yes. It's outside of their comfort zone. I, I've done readings where people get mad because the person coming through is someone that harmed them, you know? Right in some way. And they're like, yeah, I'm not ready to hear from them. And I'm definitely not going to ease their transition by, you know, alleviating their guilt. And so there's a lot of complex, complicated emotions that come up in those types of readings. So you're right. I do think permission, asking permission is always so important. And, you know, I'm sure listeners, especially listeners of uh, Psychic Teachers, my other podcast, have heard me struggle with this because as I've said, you know, who, to whom is our obligation, you know, right. the, the physical people here or the transition people on the other side, if, you know, if they're working so hard to find a medium that they can communicate this message to, where is our ethical obligation? Where does it lie? And I, I do, I do struggle with that. I don't, because I don't know the answer. And I, what just popped into my head when you said that was, uh, Unless I'm getting such a strong hit that feels like it's really, really important. Years ago, a friend of mine, her dad had passed and he kept jingling car keys at like I out of the blue, I sensed her dad and he was jingling car keys at me and it felt like, and it wouldn't go away. And it felt really insistent and really kind, wonderful, beautiful soul of a man. So I called my friend and I said, this is so random. I'm, I just, you know, it's not letting up. I have to tell you this. Your dad keeps jingling the car keys at me. So fast forward a little bit and her mom was having some cognitive issues and had tried to drive away, had found the car keys and had tried to drive away and shouldn't have been driving. So that was a message that was it a drive by on my account? No pun intended, kind of, but it also was so insistent from the person in spirit to bring the message to to my friend. That's such a great example of what I'm saying. Like where, you know, where do we where do we put these ethics, you know, with with the people in front of us or the people in spirit? And that that's such a good example of that because it's very confusing. And I think you have to trust your gut on that. But if yeah. you're just doing it to impress people or do a dog and pony show or you're feeding your own ego with how accurate you might be, then I don't vote for any of those reasons. I got to be honest, since COVID, I haven't really gotten any spontaneous drive-by things. Like My energy has felt very like combobulated when I'm out in public, right? Mm -hmm. But before that, when I would get a message for someone, I, this is what I do now. I say to my guides, if I'm supposed to ask them if I can pass on this message, I'll ask for something very specific that's happening in that moment to happen. And if it happens, I pass, I ask if I can pass on the message. If it doesn't, I trust that. So that's something else I think people could try. You know, right. if this person is ready for this message, uh, show me this or have them mention this. Right. And you've shared that in, in other episodes about if, if I'm meant to do this, then find a way that they'll let me know that they'll, yes. that the opportunity will present and that's still in my in my idea of things it's still you're still in the ethical side of things yeah for both for both sides of the veil right right 
because we have to honor spirit. We're working for spirit and we're trying to hold space for the people that we're bringing the message to. Yes. Um, So our next one is kind of a different take. Uh, My question is regarding the physical and soul level impact on a baby when the mother is grieving during pregnancy. We very unexpectedly lost my brother when I was seven months pregnant with my first daughter. Then my grandmother died shortly thereafter. As much as I tried to stay strong, the grieving was intense, and I worried about the effects it might have on my daughter. She's now 17 months old and is healthy and very social, but she doesn't cling to me like I see other babies love on mama. She isn't cuddly. She's very independent. If she prefers the company of anyone, it's my husband. I can't help but wonder if part of this is an effect of what we went through during the last bit of pregnancy. I'm pregnant again, another little girl, and I'm so excited, but the grief has resurfaced as that two to three month period at the end was so traumatic last time around. And I'm on some level preparing myself for death of some kind again. Do either of you have experiences, personal or with clients, with heavy, and I mean heavy, grief during pregnancy? A part of me also wonders if these little souls will be more intuitive because of these experiences while in the womb. I also tend to have my own intuitive channels shut off during pregnancy. I feel like I get nothing. So any insight would be greatly appreciated. I had a very significant scare during one of my pregnancies with uh, my ex-husband at the time was in a horrific car accident while I was pregnant. And there were some other health issues with some people in my life. And I worried, terribly worried that it was going to impact the baby. So I, of course, I did what I always do and jumped down the rabbit hole and read and researched and all the other things that you do and looked for any kind of a sign that is this little baby going to be okay? And he was, he's fine. Uh, but what I had understood was that there's almost a protective buffer zone for babies against grief. And whether there's any truth to this or not, or I told it to myself for other things, but we've always had a really close relationship. My gut feeling when I was reading this aloud was that I think your daughter, your first daughter came that way. And she just, she, she's just strong and independent. And she might be a little more connected with your husband, but maybe they came in with different life lessons to work on in another way. You've given, given her enough strength to be able to be independent and not clingy. Oh, the mom guilt, Denise. It never ends, does it? Oh, no. No. It just never ends. So I had this too when I was, uh, when when my former husband was shot in the line of duty and in a coma, and we were told every day for a week he was going to die at any moment, I was pregnant with Chloe. And, you know, throughout her entire pregnancy, I was stressed out because- my God, you know, he had to go to rehab and learn to walk and talk again. And I was trying to work and take care of two little ones. And I was pregnant and I was trying to pay the bills. And I had to go to city council to fight to get him a paycheck every week, if you can believe that. At the time in the city of Wilmington, if you were a police officer, you lost full pay after 21 days, even if you were injured in the line of duty, trying to keep the city safe. Happy report. I got that MF or law changed. Yes, I did. But I had to do all of that, you know, by myself while I was pregnant and taking him to so many doctor's appointments. A physiatrist, I'd never heard of a physiatrist before. Anyway, it was incredibly stressful. Uh, Chloe's fine. She's healthy. Um, She was very, very close to her dad when she was uh, first born. And I do believe what you were saying, Denise, that these these little souls, they know, they know what's going to happen. We knew what was going to happen to us with this. It's all in our soul plan. So I do believe that this is all part of her soul growth, right? This little girl's soul growth. And I think it's part of our listener's soul growth too, to have this grief and to have this connection. To me, it's a sign that this is a, this is a wise little old soul. And I think that she's going to be a very important part of our listeners' development and spiritual growth, just as much as this this mama listener is going to be an important part of her daughter's development and growth. Chloe is a very wise old soul. I remember on her on her fourth birthday, I said, "Can you?" No, I'm sorry, that was she said something else on her fourth birthday. 
It was whatever. She was a little bit older. I think she was second grade. I said, can you believe it's your birthday and you're turning this many years? And she said, oh, mom, in the scheme of the universe, I'm really a second old. (laughs) I was like, whoa. Uh, But anyway, she does have a learning disability. She has dyslexia and I have to get her tested every like, I don't know, five years so she can have her IEP. And Denise, do you know what it says on every single one of those reports? Mom experienced significant stress during the pregnancy, which most likely contributed to this. Oh. They always blame the mom. Do you ever notice that? Yeah, they do. So, yes, I do think that stress, you know, everything has an effect, but I do think that it's that it's planned. And I think that it's absolutely going to be fine. And I think that it's wonderful that this little girl is going to have a sister. There's something about sisters, you know, she's always going to have that. I always tell my daughters, the relationship you have with your sisters is the longest relationship you will have for your life. You won't know dad and me as long as you know each other. You won't know your spouses, your future partners, as long as you know your sisters. You won't know your children as long as you know your sisters. Such an important relationship, I think. So I think it's great that you're pregnant again. And just know that all of this is a part of this this whole plan. And we moms, we caregivers, all of us, dads too. But I, I do feel like society puts extra crap on moms. We need to be gentle with ourselves. We really do. We need to be kind and loving and accepting. And just remember that we are doing the best we can. And if you went through this immense amount of loss and stress during that pregnancy, know that that has fortified your little baby girl to be just as strong as you are. So I think it's not a good thing, right? I mean, it's never a good thing to go through this grief, but upon reflection, I think you'll see that it did make you stronger and it's going to make you such a wonderful advocate for this independent wise soul. Oh, that was beautiful. And I can't help but wonder if her brother is kind of looking out for that little girl, her brother that passed unexpectedly. I'm because sure she would have been so the mom would have been so connected to the energy of her brother when he passed and invited him closer with through grief or through love or loss. And it, it just feels like he's been an integral part in that little girl's life since before she even landed on the planet. Oh, beautiful. I agree. Okay, our next one says, when my son passed away, I didn't allow myself to dream about him. I remembered how painful it was when my sister first passed and I would dream about her and then wake up and have to remember that she had died and I would relive the pain over and over. So if I even had a flash of my son, I would just say no and shut down that dream. Then one day my best friend called and said, hey, your son was in my dream last night and I told him that he needed to talk to his mom. I told him you were right here. My friend didn't know that I had refused to let him in my dreams. She then told me, he said, I know she's right here, but I can't hear her. I've always heard people talk about our grief being a barrier for us on this side. We can't receive dreams or signs sometimes because our grief makes it so hard for our loved ones to get through to us. After my friend told me my son couldn't hear me, I thought, maybe when we are so deep in grief, it affects both sides. We can't hear them and they can't hear us. I definitely put a barrier between us. I did eventually remove that barrier when my heart and mind could manage the anguish. I thought it was very interesting that he went to my friend that he never met in person to get a message through to me. And I'm so thankful that she told me he came to her. Another time, my friend and I were talking on the phone and she said, that's weird. My phone just flashed the number 33. And I laughed and told her it was just Ryan saying hello. His football jersey was 33. And he often sends me that number. Wow. Okay. Do you know what image I had, Denise, when she was describing this? Do you remember being a kid and, and you and your friend would sit at the bottom of the pool and, and try to talk and read each mm-hmm. other's? That, yep. that was the image I got. And, and so I think she's right. You and I have talked on this show many, many times how the energy, the emotion, the intensity of grief, it does put up a barrier around your aura, your energy, making it very hard for our loved ones to come through, even to show us a number like 33, never mind to infiltrate our dreams. And so one of the things I mention a lot in my book, The Awake Dreamer, 
is to tell your loved one, hey, I'm really grieving you and missing you. So I know it's going to be hard to come to me in a dream, but please go to one of my friends, a neighbor, a coworker, anyone that you can, you know, get on the same energy wavelength with. And so to me, this story is just such great validation that that is how our loved ones on the other side work. They, they want so badly for us to know they're okay and alive just in a different way. They'll take any avenue they can get. That, that they can find to get a, a message through to us. There's um, a wonderful story. You know, the voice medium you and I respect, who's, you know, now sadly passed, Leslie Flynn. Yes. He tells a story about this, this man who died and, and he meets with his guide and his guide says, we have to find someone in your family who's open to all this woo-woo stuff. I'm, I'm putting words into the spirit guide's mouth, but that's basically <laughs> what she said to him. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and the guy's like, um, I think I have a cousin who like read Tarot, like he's trying to think and she's like, that'll do. We'll get a message through to her. And so I often think that's how it must work over there. You know, like Ryan's like, I, my mom can't hear me. I can't hear her. She's grieving. I need to let her know I'm okay. And they're probably like flipping through this Rolodex of like, you know, what about her sister? What about her coat? No, no, no. And then this friend who had this, this energetic opening. I think that's how it works. I love that. I absolutely love that. And I really think it's important to um, note that this one line really pops out at me. I did eventually remove that barrier when my heart and mind could manage the anguish. Mm. If you, sometimes you have to shut it out because it hurts too much to open that door, especially when you've lost someone unexpectedly or a child or someone that was the love of your life and you're, it just is, it, it hurts too much. And, but I, I really have to put out respect for this person that they set those boundaries to say, I just can't yet. And then that her son in spirit did find a friend that was open to it. And by that point, it, it, it was almost as if he knew, okay, now I can get in touch with someone and she's ready to hear from me. I agree. And don't you think there are no rules with grief? We have to be very, very patient and forgiving with ourselves. And if you have to push it down and shut it down to get through that day, then push it down and shove it down. And I know therapists are probably listening and cringing, but I don't know. I just think that's the most intense grief you can experience. And you've you got to do what you got to do to to get through the day sometimes. And if pushing it down is going to help you that day, and 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 the the word she used yet, you know, there's so much hope in that word. Yes. And it, that's one of the things that, that unites us all as human beings on the planet is that we grieve and that we feel it so deeply in our heart when we have that loss, when we have that pain, when we have that. It's it's horrific. But everyone, I shouldn't say everyone, but it's a universal experience. That being said, it's also a very unique experience. And you and I have both lost our fathers, different times in our lives, different things. We felt that immense pain of losing a parent, but we also had to go through it on our own timeline, our own experiences, our own memories. And I think that's so, so important. And thank you for bringing that up. You have to do it in the way that works best for you. Yeah. And I think when you talk about the loss of a child, all bets are off. There's nothing a nothing mm-hmm. that would compare to that. And you just have to be really, really patient with yourself, which reminds me, someone emailed me and asked if I know of an online grief support group for parents who have lost children that I could recommend. And I don't, I know of a local one. I don't know of an online one. So if anyone knows of a reputable, really good online grief support group, let us know. Do you know of one, Denise? Uh, I don't want to recommend I, something I'm, I, I don't know about, you know? No. And something I am really confident recommending is grief.com with David Kessler. And there are a lot of resources and links there that will, um, I'm sure you could find some, a, a direction to go with that because you're right. That's a very, very personal connection. And it, are you, I'm, but again, yes, if there is a listener that has something that's saying, no, this is very reputable. I believe the Forever Family Foundation also offers a grief support program for parents. 
Mm-hmm. That That's may be a another reason. option. Yeah, say that again. The the Forever Family organization. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We we need to post that. That's a great one. Okay. All right. Our next one. I have two severely mentally ill brothers and I've watched my father slide downhill by enabling them and taking on their problems. As a result, my dad has suffered from many physical heart issues. I'm terrified that he'll die from a broken heart. He just went to urgent care tonight and had to increase his medication. I feel very sorry for my dad, but at the same time, he's codependent and he's choosing what he's what he's not changing. I want to live a happy life, lovingly detached from this mess and not take on my family problems. I view my brothers as teachers. From them, I've learned all about unconditional love, patience, radical acceptance, and compassion. I pray for my parents and brothers, but every time I do, I cry. How can I set energetic boundaries and lovingly detach? I don't want my heart to break from witnessing all this pain and suffering, but sometimes it feels like I just can't breathe. Number one, mental illness can be insidious and it's so difficult. You know, the, all my years in special ed, and I did work a lot with behaviorally disordered with, with uh, young people who had mental health issues. That was kind of my, (laughs) of all things to call it a specialty, but it was something I was very um, adept at and spent a lot of my career doing. And uh, it's, there is that, that codependent issue with it. It's no different than if you're dealing with someone who has severe substance abuse, the, the physical heartbreak, uh, the broken heart. And I read about that of, you know, we automatically think it's just severe grief that does that but it does manifest those physical symptoms of shortness of breath, heart pain, anxiety, numbness. There's so many physical characteristics that, I mean, I can see why she's very concerned for her dad. One thing for herself, I love that for this person, setting the boundaries is a beautiful gift to your brothers, to your dad, your parents, and yourself. There are uh, 12-step programs and they work for some people, they work for others. Uh, codependent has, there is a, a 12 step support program for codependents that you may want to check out. It's an online community that it might help you with this. I know there are a lot of uh, programs available for families of those suffering with mental health issues. But I, I think that in your life path, in your life lessons, setting these boundaries and realizing you have to step back. Maybe that's the best role you can play in their lives. And it's, and for your parents, the God, please know how much empathy and love and compassion we're sending to you. This is a hard, hard thing to live through. It's really a hard thing, especially for an empath who feels so deeply and wants to just help and, and heal. When, when I think about you know, codependency and all the issues that go on in in families that are dealing with this, a metaphor that comes to mind is like a house on fire, right? And the codependent keeps running into the house to put the fire out. And what happens to the codependent running in? They're getting burned. They're getting smoke inhalation. And the house isn't there. It's still going to be on fire. So at some point you have to decide, I'm not running into that house anymore. And that's hard. And something I've learned about setting a boundary, I really did think when I started like going to therapy for my issues with my mom and my codependency with her and started reading all the books that you're supposed to read and all that, I really did think it was one and done. I thought like, oh, once I get the inner strength to set this boundary, that's it. I can check that off my list. And that's not how boundary setting works. You have to set it again and again and again. And something else I didn't know is when you set a boundary with a family member or two family members, it affects all the other family members because you're setting that boundary. So it's going to affect your relationships with the other people as well. And that was something I wasn't really prepared for. Do you know what I mean? Am I explaining that? You're explaining it beautifully. You are because it causes a ripple effect and you're, they haven't changed. You have. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And it's hard because to a codependent, especially 
when you set a boundary, they look at you as though you're selfish. Right. And I'm a lot of things, but I'm not selfish. And being viewed that way by other members of my family when I was setting my boundaries, that was really hard for me, really, really hard for me. And I don't think I don't think you can do this alone. I don't think you can or should. So I think you need to either seek out a trusted therapist or read a lot of books that are very, very helpful. Um, anything by Susan Ford, I love. Very good on setting boundaries. Um, and talk to a trusted friend, someone, someone, a safe person. But you can't, you can't do this alone because it's a lot of complicated emotional issues. And I don't think we can discount the power of prayer. The power of just, I know it causes you pain and you cry, as you said in your beautiful email, but the power of our prayers for the people we love, I don't think we can even see it in the moment how impactful it is. So I would recommend that that every day, just maybe light a candle for your dad, or maybe light three candles, you know, for your brothers and your dad, and just surround them in, in light and love. But know that you're doing big work when you set this boundary. And if you jump back in to help your dad, you're just running back into that house on fire, you know? That's how I look at it. I could be wrong. What do you what do you think? Well, the only thing I'd like to add, because that's you covered a lot with that, really, really helpful stuff, is a very classic book that is uh codependent no more by Melody Beatty. Incredible, incredible resource for anyone who's struggling with any type of codependence. It's an older book but it will help you face those things of not feeling selfish or taking care of yourself or see some of the patterns that have led up to this because it's a thing for empathic people, which we all are. There's a very fine line and a lot of us end up in codependent situations because we feel things so deeply. So not only are we dealing with our own emotional, the only, the emotional impact of having two brothers that have severe mental illness, but all and and seeing the impact on your family, you're also having that all of that in within yourself of feeling it so, so, so deeply as as a family member. So that's a really great resource to have. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Our next one says. My wife and I were supposed to be on our honeymoon, and unfortunately, we found out at the airport that my wife's passport was expired. The trip is rescheduled, so no worries. I truly believe that we weren't meant to go when we had planned. We were in Miami and chose to spend the night as we drove from Tampa that morning. When we went to bed that night, I had a dream that my wedding ring and band, we had soldered together, so they became one ring, but in the dream, the two had split. My wedding ring and wedding band were separate again. I didn't think much of it. It was just that it was weird. And now I have to deal with two rings again. On the drive home the next morning, my wife tells me that she had a dream that her wedding ring and band split. We were both shocked and just giggled at it. Knowing how important dreams can be, I started going through the different meanings. My wife and I were in a good place when going to bed. We were both stressed for sure over the missed trip, but this experience did not make our relationship any less stable. So it's symbolizing us splitting doesn't resonate with me. I thought that maybe my wife subconsciously was nervous this would be bad for our relationship and maybe I was picking up on her feelings and dreams or we were just so in sync and we needed the same dream to confirm that for us. I had many synchronicities from Spirit on the way to the airport and even after the trip hadn't worked out. So I know it all happened exactly how we needed it to. I'm just not sure what the dream could mean and I would love to know your thoughts. Okay, so... Yeah, if I if I had this experience, I would I would go into all those dark places too. Oh my gosh, this means we're going to separate. But I really did think about this email and this dream and I thought about some of the research I've done on dreams and when people are bonded so closely with love and when they have those positive cords of love flowing back and forth between their hearts, they they can visit each other in the dream state, right? And so to me, this is even more than a shared dream experience. It's almost like you were you were like with your wife in her dream over helping her with the anxiety over this. And because our subconscious can only think and process in pictures and symbols, of course, this would be the perfect symbol of, oh my God, this trip didn't work out. Is this a sign? Does this mean we're going to split? And the subconscious 
hears that. And the only way the subconscious can process that is through a picture image. And what better picture image than the two sordid rings splitting? So I think you had this dream really more that you were visiting your wife's dream to comfort her because at the end of the day, with anything we experience, whether it's in our waking life or our dreaming life or in our intuitive life, Sure, you can go to the books and the experts and what does it mean to dream of a cougar, a fox, or a ring? You, you can do all that. But at the end of the day, you've got to go with your emotions. And when you woke up from that dream, you weren't feeling stressed. You weren't feeling any nervous. You thought you giggled. You laughed about it. Oh, ha ha, I have to deal with two rings again. Nothing like that. So you've got to trust those feelings. You felt that this relationship and you know this relationship is strong and full of love. And so really, to be honest, that's what I think that dream was. Another take I have on that dream, though, is that even if you two had to split for a trip, like, right, so you showed up at the airport, you could go, your passport was fine, your wife couldn't, hers was expired. So that's your subconscious is like, oh, like, can we even be apart like this? I feel like that dream was telling you, even if you are apart, you're still together. It's still the wedding ring. It's still the circle of unending love. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And just the fact that they had the same dream is validation enough that they're that bonded and close and connected. And I I love this story. I think we need it because I didn't get a negative feeling from it either. And I, I think that's really, really important is, and even with visitation dreams, don't you think as well that some people will say, oh, I had a dream about so-and-so in my dream. And their past and were they trying to warn me or was something negative coming? If if you get that feeling, then honor that, but generally just follow your heart and you're going to be on the right track with things. Unless you're a negative Nelly. And if you are, you know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> right. If you're Eeyore and then that's- Yeah. If you're the Eeyore of right. the group, yes. you've got to know that. You got to be honest about yourself and just be like, all right, I always look at things as negative at first. Let me let me push that aside and go deeper into my intuition. And I know I've said this before, but it cracks me up every time is why is Eeyore so sad? Because I have a nail in my ass. <laughs> <laughs> it gets me every time. <laughs> Well, we hope you have a week with no nails in your asses and, <laughs> and sweet, wonderful, happy dreams and visits from your loved ones on the other side and lots of magical synchronicities and just wishing you a week filled with positivity, love and light. Thank you guys so much for listening and checking us out. Please remember, as always, to show up, do great work and share your light. Take care.